Hello everyone, and welcome back to another video. In the last couple of videos, I've done a lot with lightweight PLA printing for our seaplane project, and I've never really gotten into how that really works. Lightweight PLA is a material that's pretty hard to get right, and depending on your printer, it can be more difficult or a little bit easier to get it right, but I've not really ever shown my settings at all. Because I use a specific set of settings uh, for my lightweight PLA printing that's not really what most other people do because I like to push the boundaries pretty hard when it comes to just how light I can make things. So today I want to show you my settings and compare them to some other settings that are more typical uh, at the hand of this model. Uh, which is part of the JRM01C Junior. Yes, I've actually bought an AeroJTP plane to build it because I am retiring the 30mm F111 because I'm moving to 40mm EDFs and I want to use the electronics for something. And well, that jet uses the exact same electronics. So, yeah. Um, today I want to go through my lightweight PLA V3 profile, which is somewhat new, I recently updated things, but the general idea of how I've been printing things has been uh, already there for my last couple projects. Um, I've printed most of the JRM that you're going to see soon with my V3 profile, I've printed SN5 of the F111 with V3, uh, and I've also printed uh, my propeller plane that you're also going to see soon. Um, with this profile. And so far all of these have worked, none of these have experienced structural failures that uh, occurred because the material couldn't take the load of flight. Um, if you crash them hard it's still gonna break obviously, but that's gonna always happen. Um, so yeah, this profile is flight proven, it does work. Uh, it doesn't quite look at as nice, it's, it's very slightly worse visually uh, than most other profiles because again I'm pushing the boundaries pretty hard, but Unless you're sitting there with a magnifying glass and really looking at the layer accuracy, you're not going to notice the difference. So, yeah, let's get right into it. Before we continue, I'd like to thank my sponsor, PCBWay. If you are working on a project of your own that requires parts that would be hard to make yourself, or just generally parts at a much higher quality standard, you can go to PCBWay's website and order anything from PCB prototypes, assemblies, CNC parts, 3D printed parts, as well as stencils or even flexible circuit boards. The ordering process is simple, you just upload your files, tell them some stuff that you need, and you'll quickly receive a quote, which once accepted, will mean that your part can get shipped out within as fast as 24 hours. And if you have any questions or require further help, they even have a live chat service that stands ready for you. So if you need some custom-made project parts, don't delay, go to PCBWay today. So. First off, we should take a look at the print settings here in Prusa Slicer and a little bit of a note on why I'm using Prusa Slicer. It is my preferred slicing software. I've tested many slicers in my time. Uh, I started out using Cura and Lightweight PLA works okay in Cura, but everything else just kind of doesn't, not to the same quality standard as in Prusa Slicer, which is why I prefer this software. Prusa Slicer is also what Bamboo and Orca Slicer are built on, and um, Creality Slicer is, is a bit weird. It used to be based on Cura, but the newest version when I tested it had some features from Prusa Slicer and felt a lot more like Prusa Slicer than Cura, so I don't really know if they changed what it's based on or if they just kind of mashed it together, but uh, yeah. You can use these settings in whatever slicer you want, of course. Um, I am, I'll just say that uh, I tested specifically also the V3 profile by copying the settings to Cura, and while it worked, I got more stringing. So um, if stringing is a problem, because it, with Lightweight PLA it always is, you can never fully eliminate it. Uh, with Cura I consistently got more stringing despite the settings being identical. So yeah, but now actually let's get into the print settings. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess we're just gonna go category by category, uh, point out the changes that I made. But yeah, so my profile is, as pretty much everything, 0.2 millimeters. Sometimes if you have problems with first layer, you can bump this up to 0.28 millimeters. 
uh, that's just gonna make the first layer a bit thicker and hopefully you know get you a bit better grip but uh, by default I have this at 0.2 then uh, outer walls just one this is pretty much standard with lightweight PLA profiles we are printing one external wall that's it very little infill very little top and bottom layers too you can see both of these are set at just two um, for the bottom layers that's fine top layers at two are not always perfect um, these tend to not be that great visually sometimes so if you have a large flat area at a top surface maybe increase this to three perhaps even four if you have some quality issues but most flat top areas are usually parts where you like you glue things together and you not you don't see the top surface anyway so leaving this at two and saving some weight is perfectly fine then a bit of uh, an interesting setting right here and important one is avoid crossing perimeters you need to check this this will not completely remove the printhead crossing over walls, but it will try to reduce it whenever it can. And from what I can tell, uh, Prusa Sizer's imp implementation of this is more efficient than Cura's, which is, I think, where that extra stringing comes from. Um, but yeah, so lightweight PLA, it will always string. It is an active foaming material, so as long as your hot end is hot, it will uh, expand and ooze out of the nozzle and it does not matter how fast your travel moves is um, it's always going to come out a little bit like the faster you move to the uh, to where you start printing again the less you're gonna lose to oozing but there will always be some that you lose to that um, so yeah you, you're going to have that you're going to have stringing from that and this setting um, make sure that that stringing is not going to be on the outside of your part where it interferes with uh, the fitment or just is there as visual clutter. So this is going to make sure that whenever we do travel moves we want to do it on the inside of the part uh, leaving any ooze material in there. Uh, yeah, then the rest is not really that important. Um, I like to put the seam position to aligned. That's a visual preference thing. There's not really anything more super um, interesting here, so let's move on to the next. Infill. So, uh, the infill pattern that you will always use is gyroid. Gyroid is and has been shown in multiple tests uh, to be the best or like most efficient infill pattern when it comes to strength versus weight in all directions. Because we're building our seaplane parts and because flying is, of course, very dynamic, we want an infill pattern that has uniform strength. We, we want a pattern that no matter from which direction you apply force to it, it's supposed to be the same strength. So we want one of the 3D patterns, like Cubic is another one. But of all the 3D patterns, Gyroid is the lightest and strongest, like it has the best strength to weight ratio. Therefore, we are always going to be Gyroid, like Every single time you print something lightweight, use gyroid uh, because everything else will either be weaker or add more weight. Then for the infill density, this kind of depends on um, what part exactly you do. I print a lot at 5% or 4%. Um, sometimes you can also go down to like 3.5, sometimes you want to go up to perhaps 9%. It really depends on what part you're printing. By default, it's usually four or five for me. Um, and like you can lower it for parts that are perhaps like bigger and don't need that much strength on the inside uh, or put it up for parts that are smaller, thinner, but are like experiencing quite a lot of load. So this you'll have to vary depending on uh, which part you have. But by default, I use four or five percent. Then uh, info anchor is turned off. That's just, yeah, it's it's off. <laughs> so what this does is um, it makes sure that the infill has a proper connection to the outside of the wall. So it prints a little bit of extra infill. Uh, and that material adds up. Uh, lightweight PLA is usually pretty good at getting connections because it does foam up, it does expand. So even if your infill is just a tiny bit short of the wall, usually with lightweight PLA, you still get it to stick. So you don't really need this with lightweight PLA. And again, the weight of this 
of this little bit that it prints extra every time a bit of infill contacts the wall is going to add up and is uh, going to contribute to your weight. So I turn this off. If you have problems with your infill not uh, sticking to walls correctly, you can turn this on and maybe set it to one or two millimeters. Otherwise, leave this off. Then, uh, skirt and brim. Uh, this is just a personal preference thing. I put two loops and make them three layers high. This is uh, first so that, because I've observed that um, the oozing you get during the heat up process, like you get quite a lot of oozed out lightweight PLA as the hot end heats up. And the purge line it does at the beginning of the print usually isn't enough to get that ooze oozed material to separate from the nozzle. It usually still drags it with it after it does the purge line. So I do a skirt to do that because it more reliably gets rid of that extra stuff. Uh, you can of course remove it by hand, but you know what, don't always catch the printer as it starts right away. Um, so this is mostly for that. Um, and then I make it two loops thick and three layers high because that just makes it easier to remove. That, that, that's the whole reason. Lightweight PLA sticks to print surfaces quite well, especially PEI. Uh, so if you make this just one layer high or maybe two, it's like sometimes it can be hard to get it off of the print plate. Uh, so at three layers, it's usually pretty easy and consistent to get off. Then supports. Um, well, supports are currently turned off in this profile, but I did change some settings. Um, the style really, again, depends on what part you, you want. Usually I design my own parts to just not need supports at all. Um, but yeah, it, it depends. Uh, usually I prefer snug or organic, depending on whether the surface I'm supporting is above the build plate or above other 3D printed parts, because I don't want to put supports on something that's already printed, that, that, that usually just doesn't work. Um, so I want the supports to start on the build plate uh, and yeah, depending on whether the supported part is also above empty build plate, then you can use snug uh, and if it's not, use organic. The uh, top contact Z distance is at 0.2 millimeters. Uh, this is, this has worked for me. Um, you can separate the supports from the parts without uh, having them fuse together too badly, but it's also it, it, it is pretty well attached, like the support is not gonna fall off or anything. So uh, this seems to be a good value for me. Um, so yeah. Then for the pattern, I like to use a uh, rectilinear grid. This makes uh, snug supports just a little bit more reliable because usually it does the snake pattern all the way up. Uh, rectilinear grid makes it reverse the snake pattern every other layer, so it's just a bit more rigid. Uh, and that's what I like. Then the speed. This one is very important. Uh, I have it printed uh, pretty fast compared to the print settings that AeroJTP Aero recommend. This is a bit faster than what they recommend. Um, they recommend 35 millimeters a second. I'm going up to 40 just because it reduces the print time just a little bit. And as you're going to see, that little bit of a reduction can sometimes be multiple hours because this print speed is pretty low. But we have to keep it this low because, again, the lightweight PLA is actively foaming and it needs time to foam up. If you print faster than this, it's it doesn't have enough time to expand. And basically you're printing as if it was regular PLA at that point. Because if you keep the flow rates as low, it's just not going to extrude properly uh, at higher speeds than this. So everything is set to 40 millimeters a second. Every single thing, you want to keep the speed very consistent because the faster you go, the less time there is to expand and vice versa. And we want uniform, consistent expansion of the material for everything. So everything is at 40 millimeters a second. Then the travel is put really high, like basically put this as high as you go. Uh, because again, we have oozing whenever we don't print and we want to move to the next printing position as quickly as possible. So put this as high as your printer can support. Same with the accelerations. So uh, I, I've i been steadily increasing my printer accelerations as time goes on. I started out at 3500, then moved to 5000. Now I'm at 6000. Uh, again, the higher this is, the faster your travel moves are going to be whenever you're not printing and you're going to minimize stringing and material loss. That's just going to be like oozed out crap on the inside of your part. 
Then, uh, in advanced settings, this is one special thing that I do. You typically don't really see this in other people's profiles. I have changed the extrusion widths. Everything is set to 0.4 except the external perimeters. These are, two, these are set to 0.5. And the idea behind this is, uh, if you've done like even a basic engineering course at like university or high school, at some point uh, you'll have been taught that the load on an object that like um, like a girder that's being bent, uh, you have compressive force on one side and then like stretchy force like I don't know how to describe it uh, on the other side, but in the middle of the girder there's no force at all. There's there's a point where the stretching and the compressing Cancel, it up, cancel each other out and there's no force whatsoever. And on our 3D printed parts, that point is always going to be in the infill. And the highest force is always going to be on the out, uh, outside, the outer skin of the part. And this right here is essentially, we reduce everything a little bit to 0.4, like the defaults are like 0.42 to 0.44, something like that. We reduce all of that a bit because that's going to reduce the, the the amount of material we put in the infill a bit but we are increasing the external perimeter to 0.5 so the outer skin of our parts is going to be 25 percent thicker and therefore going to be able to handle a lot more force than at standard thickness so that is the idea uh like basically we're taking some strength away from the inside of the part and we're putting it to the outside of the part where we get the highest forces so this way, uh, we can reduce our weight a bit, but still get good strength because the one part where the highest forces are is still strengthened uh, by 25% overall by there being more material to take up the load. And this is the main change that uh, I do um, compared to most other people, together with one other that we're going to get into the filament section. Um, yeah, in here there's not that much. Sometimes I use the sequential printing uh, thing. Uh, a little note on that. Uh, here you need to enter just how, like, a radius of something around your nozzle, like how big is your print head, so the slicer knows like when it would be knocking off the parts of the print bit. And this is a bit weird. Uh, I set this to like 999, because this is kind of exploiting the slicer. <laughs> Because usually you're supposed to set this to the distance between your x-axis gantry and your nozzle, uh, because then the printhead can move freely around on the print bed. Um, but I like to print uh, models that are higher than that distance because it's usually pretty low. Um, so what I do, I set this super high so the slicer essentially ignores it, and then I just make sure that the printing order is in such a way the x-axis gantry never crosses where the already printed parts are. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit jank, but you can print multiple lightweight PLA parts that way because you don't want to print more than one part at a time because then in every layer you would have to move in between the parts and again, extra stringing. So, like this, you can print multiple parts without having to print them at the same time. It just it finishes one first and then the second and the third. Problem being that the printer has to lower down to where it would collide with the part uh, if it moved to certain sections of the print bed. So it's a bit weird. Um, <laughs> I use this sometimes when printing like multiple smaller objects like wingtips or uh, rudders or something. Um, yeah, just wanted to point this out because uh, it can be quite useful if you want to print like multiple smaller parts. Then filaments. So this is the filament section. And here is the other change that I do uh, compared to most people. My flow rate is very low. This is 45% flow, less than half of what you would normally have. This is the other reason <laughs> um, why I'm pushing the boundaries quite hard, because usually you see flow rates from around like 53 to 60%. I'm all the way down at 45, and this is like the very lowest that I can print without the parts like not working at all. Like, I, I did some tests, and this is the very lowest it can go. You'll also see that my print temperature is kind of high, and to this I have to say that this depends on what printer you have. This right here is for my standard end of 3 uh, printers that I upgraded. They still have the same heater block that they had stock, so uh, the standard E3D V6 heater block. 
um, and the, the larger your melt zone is, the lower you can set the temperature. Uh, and since the E3DV6 uh, has a rather small uh, um, heat, heat zone, melt zone, compared to what you get these days, uh, I have the temperature quite high. Um, on ColorFab's website, there's a bit of a guide on how to calibrate these things. That's also how I found the minimum flow rate. So you can read through that and it will talk you through doing some test prints and figuring out like what's the optimal temperature for you to print at. Um, so yeah, so for Ender 3 uh, printers, that's 250. For my Ender 5 S1, which has a larger melt zone, it's about 50% longer. I bring this down all the way to 235. And then for my Anycubic Viper, which has a volcano hotend, I bring this down all the way to 225. Uh, and they basically get the same result. Like, that's a pretty big temperature difference, but because those printers have a longer melt zone, uh, they don't need as high of a temperature to get the same amount of foaming because the filament is just in the melt zone longer. Uh, so yeah, so this will change depending on what printer you have. So, um, yeah, keep that in mind uh, when you print with this yourself. Uh, then, um, cooling's pretty standard, just like, you know, after a couple layers, the fan turns on 100%. Um, there's not really much going on here. Uh, and here's something. So, this disables retraction. And this is also important because you can't retract lightweight PLA. If you retract lightweight PLA, the already foamed up uh, lightweight PLA is going to be sucked into the melt zone where either it's going to cause a jam or it's going to be overcooked and like over expand and that leads to material defects and you're going to get like these brown molten PLA drops in your print. So don't retract lightweight PLA. It disturbs the, f uh, the, the foaming and it can lead to clogs. You can't retract lightweight PLA because it expands from heat. Uh, and therefore, you need to disable this here, because in Prusa Slicer, your retractants are set by the, by the uh, extruder setting right here, by the printer. Uh, so, yeah, no retractions with lightweight PLA. Keep that in mind. And that's pretty much it. Like, there's nothing special going on in the printer uh, settings here. Like, this is just like my end of three settings. And, uh, yeah, so... That's uh, the settings, and if we slice now, like uh, use this big fuselage part of the Jerem uh, O1C Junior right here. This is the biggest part, and here you're gonna see in a minute uh, <laughs> how long this takes. Because again, uh, the print speed is pretty low, though the accelerations are quite high. And remember, we're only printing 4% uh, infill, one external perimeter. We're just not pin printing that much, so. Um, the print speed is going to be faster than you think, but it's still going to take quite a long time. Uh, and this is also a big part, so it takes quite a long time to slice everything. But yeah, um, there you see it. <laughs> 8 hours and 44 minutes, and uh, yeah. That, and this is already with my like slightly higher print speed, uh, with the uh, settings that they recommend. Um, this is like close to 10 hours. So yeah, admittedly, this is one of the biggest parts. Um, the whole JRM, all the 3D printed uh, parts together are 177 grams. And you can see that this is already 52 of those. Um, so this is like one of the biggest parts. And when you look inside, you can really see that there is there's not much going on. We, we have the outer wall and we have our 4% infill, which is not a lot. Like you can see, there's plenty of uh, room left over. Um, so yeah, that is how you get the lightweight parts. That is how I print mine. Um, and yeah, they are pushing the boundaries pretty hard. Uh, they're not gonna be as sturdy as some of the other um, like offerings. Like I used to print um, like SN2 of the F111 was printed with my old profile that was 230 degrees and it was at 60% flow. Those parts were pretty strong, but they were also like 40% heavier. <laughs> so uh, it's not really it's not really an option uh, if you want something that's really lightweight. And uh, I'm comfortable bringing uh, the infill and the flow rate that low 
because I have that thicker outer skin, which like th that's where most of the forces are. Like ideally you'd want nothing on the inside, but then the part would just kind of like, you need something to provide some rigidity. Uh, so that's why the 4% infill are there. But uh, yeah, uh, that's the idea of my uh, lightweight PLA profiles. And I hope I could help you with uh, your lightweight PLA printing. So yeah, uh, <laughs> that would be it. So thank you all for watching and until next time, goodbye.